Virginia. Um, most of you probably know a lot about him. I will let him tell about himself. But for today, you are an honorary PFI member, and I would ask that you wear a PFI hat while you're giving your talk. <laughs> Relationship. 
relationships with complementary gifts and talents, it's going to be a hard road to hope. Okay? So we've got to start out realizing this isn't going to be a one-man show or a one-woman show. It's going to be a show where there are usually two, three, four people, maybe not all full-time, maybe, maybe they're on part-time, maybe they're commissioned, maybe they're related, maybe they're not. But it's going to be more than one person. And uh, so that, that, that's the first thing. And, and, and it frustrates me when I run into people that say, well, you know, it's going to be me and Matilda, nobody else. We don't want anybody else around. That's a hard deal. Okay? Uh, for some of us, it's, uh, it's mechanics. You, know, you do well. You do torch work, fabrication, work, design, engineering. I mean, we all say a farmer has to wear all these hats. Well, I'm trying to tell you that the idea that a farmer has to wear all these hats is an idea that holds farmers back from success. And if we would say, I don't want to wear all those hats. Which ones do I want to wear? Which ones do I not want to wear? Now, how can I find people to fill the ones that I don't want to wear? Okay? So, the first big deal is about people and about, about building a team. Building a team that will have the necessary ingredients for a recipe for success. It makes a lot of that for All right. Now, we've got a piece of land. We look out at that land. Well, the land is not always homogeneous. It's got buildings on it. We probably live in a house. We, we, uh, that means we have a southern exposure, a northern exposure. We've got an eastern exposure or a western exposure. We've got a roof that, that catches water and makes a, a, a wet area under the eaves. Uh, what we have to look at is we have to look at the microclimates around the homestead, around the farmstead, and see how can we leverage that microclimate to grow something that really wants to grow there. And there are a lot of plants that like shade. We'll put them on the north side of the building. There are a lot of plants that need extra moisture. We'll put in a planter under the eaves of the barn and take advantage of the moisture. So for example, we're growing our shiitake mushrooms. We've got, a, we've got a, a, a barn roof that slopes off into a couple of walnut trees along that provide shade there. It's a real shady area. And so we stack our shiitake mushrooms under the eaves of that thing that even in a hot July day in a drought, that sheet metal roofing collects moisture and drips in the in the early morning uh, you know, sun, and it creates this this especially damp area. Uh, you know, espalier trees on uh, on walls. Uh, you can push seasons. You can you can use a, a a rock wall or some sort of retaining wall as a thermal mask. Put a little uh, you know a little cabin panel with a with a piece of plastic over the top, suddenly you've got a poor boy, a poor boy greenhouse, a poor boy cold frame. Um, we, we've, we've got these uh, three hoop houses that we tear a skin on a, on a hillside. So there's a, you know, there's a sharp bank between them. We took blocks on the one terrace and, uh, and, and, made, and made a four foot wide, 120 foot long terrace that will be, be garden beds that take advantage of all the moisture that comes off of the hoop house before it heads on down the hill. And then we're planting fruit trees, plum trees and stuff on all the rest of them to take advantage of all that of all that tearing, of, of all that water that comes off of the hoop structure. And to provide shade in the summer as deciduous trees as they grow up, they provide shade to the hoop structures and they drop the leaves in the winter to get full sun into the house in the winter and shade in the summer because we grow plants in there in the summertime. So, uh, so we want to look at all these little spots. You know, maybe it's a gray water area. You know, the gray water area, we could, we could put in a, uh, uh, a, a, you know, a pond, or not a pond, or a kind of a main, a main wetland of daylilies and bulrushes that can take up the nutrients in the gray water. You know, you can, you can take a, uh, it's called a, a gray water trough, and you can just 
to make a trough out through there and fill it up with wood chips or hay or straw. And every year, the nutrients in the gray water will compost aerobically in this, in this ditch filled with biomass and provide you the most beautiful uh, compost and potting soil you can imagine. So you take the gray water, which will just make a little kind of wet spot, and you suddenly create a fertilizer manufacturing facility out of that. Uh, I'm just brainstorming, but, but I hope you, you get the point. I want you, I want you to think about looking around and saying, what is a, what is something on this landscape and around these buildings? What is something that could be used? Uh, I mean, the, the, the size, the size of a building can trellis. Um, Cucumbers. We, uh, one of the things that we do is uh, round bale feeders. What do you do with round bale feeders in the summertime? You know, you just roll them up and they're in the way, right? So we, we roll these things up and uh, string old baler twine up and down them and plant cucumbers and let the cucumber vines grow up the, uh, grow up the uh, round bale feeders and use round bale feeders as a poor boy trellis. Okay? So if we're going to have machinery, we're going to have these micro spots and all this, what we want to do is leverage those micro spots uh, for season extension, for extra water, for something that needs extra dry, or needs extra sun. Uh, another, just one more thing that we do is we have a floating garden on uh, six inch PVC pipes. So it's a 10 foot or 10 foot raft on six inch PVC. It goes out the pond. You put compost on it, you plant in it. And, uh, and you, know, you can pull it to shore when you want to harvest something. You shove it back out there when you don't. But the beauty is the plant. The plants uh, can get as damp or not as they want to. It encourages the pond having a shade on the water and the oxygenation of the plant root uh, filaments uh, increase all the little snails and things underneath so the fish can feed off of the little snails and the attracted uh, uh, light that's on the rootlets of the plants. And the pond reflects the sunlight to underneath the leaves of the stomata. So now the leaves, grow, the plants grow faster because they're getting sunlight from both underneath the leaf and above the leaf. And the pond acts as a moat, so any bugs that want to fly to your garden get eaten by fish on their way over to the to the um, floating garden. So, so these are all all things that we can do to leverage microsoft. And if we have a machine, we want to use it more. We don't want to use it less. We want to use it more. That's the only way you can pay for a machine is to use it more. So if you have a tractor, you want to figure out how can we use the tractor more. I know a lot of you are thinking, that's counterintuitive. You know, I want to use it less because it costs money. We well, you know it costs money while it's sitting there depreciating. So the reason, the reason you want to use it is to get your money out of it as it depreciates. So, you know, for some people, if you've got a tractor and you enjoy equipment, a wonderful little side business while you're building this farm would be some sort of, you know, custom work, whether it's preparing gardens or doing some landscaping or, or custom harvesting hay for the neighbors or something. But, but what we want to do is use that equipment for more things. And then all the infrastructure we have, we want to leverage it to its greatest efficiency. Um, I think I think one of the one of my favorite examples of this is the, the growth over time of our egg mobiles. So you're familiar with our egg mobiles. We follow the cows with, with an egg mobile. Well, let me show. Let me explain the uh, the evolution of the egg mobile. So 30 years ago, uh, I conceived of this idea of a, of a portable hen house. And so I just built a little thing on bicycle wheels. It was uh, six feet wide and eight feet long, 48 square feet. Yeah. Um, I'll say that's, that, that's two feet bigger than she was flying with the ground. Okay. Six by eight, okay. I have a mesh floor and uh, bicycle wheels on the edges. It was a little short thing, you know, it, it came up with a little, uh, you know, regular E type roof. Um, and the, the top of the, the top of the roof was maybe this high. Uh, mess box saddlebags hung out over the bicycle wheels so it kept the sun off of them so they wouldn't dry rock and they kept 
get the rain off of those little roots, the berries that we get wet. And uh, it was small enough, I could put uh, 40 chickens in there, and, um, and, and I, had, I had a, a yard made, uh, this was before, this was before electric netting, this was before the, you know, premier netting, all that electrified netting, so I made up some, some uh, 10 foot gates with poultry netting on them, wired them together, so I had two sets of triplicates that I could then unfold, and I had a hexagonal yard, are you with me, because they held up, you know, by having obtuse angles. And uh, so what I would do is I would just uh, I would just put you know one yard out for a couple of days and then I would you know, fold the two pairs of triplicates in and I'd move around to the other side and once I took the yard around the house then you know I just push it up the field on bicycle wheels and we do another circle. Well I did that for a year and it worked really really great and um, and one time I intersected right where the cows had grazed through. And I noticed the chickens running to these cow patties and just tearing them up. And, and I looked in here, they were, they were eating the fly larva, and I mean, the, and in, in 15 minutes I couldn't find a cow patty in there. And suddenly, you know, the lights went off, and I, oh, yeah, the birds, herbivores, you know, chickens, cow. So that winter, I replicated this little house and put it on a three-point hitch so I could hook it up to the tractor and take it behind the cow. And uh, so I did that for a season and I saw the advantages of the chickens scratching through the cow patties and spreading that out for fertility. Suddenly we had you know, no, we had a much less fly situation. We had no heel fly warbles because they ate the warbles when they you know, rolled out of the back and, 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 and the, chick, the, the eggs were fantastic because the chickens basically ate no grain whatsoever. The yolks were this orange yolk. You know, of course, our customers were nuts over this. They started asking for more eggs, which we didn't have. <laughs> and so, the next year, I built the first 12 foot by 20 foot egg, egg mobile, put 100 chickens in there. And boy, I thought, I thought we hit a rock. We got 100 chickens out here in this egg mobile. Started moving it behind the cows. Well, People wanted more eggs. So we put in 100 more. Got 200 in there. They wanted more eggs. And it suddenly dawned on me, and here's the principle I'm trying to articulate. You know what? It doesn't take one more minute to hook that egg mobile up to the tractor and move it with 200 birds in it. In fact, it doesn't take another minute. In fact, it's even more efficient to hook it up and move it with 200 in it with a pen, then it did to hook up that three-point hitch out of deal with 40. Now, we run uh, 10 of these egg mobiles. There's, we have five. We have six, six, we have 12 of them. Six pairs of egg mobiles with 4,000 birds, and, and they're, and, and they're, they're um, the pairs can each handle 400 birds apiece for 800 birds. So, so we filled up one. We, we went all the way to 400, and then we went on to 500, and we found out that 500 were, were too many. That, that it was too, uh, you actually get them in there. The problem was it made too much social pressure for the birds to come into the, in the doors at night. The, 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 uh, the bossy hens, the bossy women, would stand there at the door and keep out the timid women, and and we couldn't break through. But we found that if we if we went that at 400 with a back door, it would work. <laughs> so we found our limitations to that deal. So you know all the bossy ones couldn't be at one door, so the timid ones would run around and get in the back door. And that that leveraged out. Well then, one more egg. And uh, I'm sitting here thinking, well, you know, we can't make a structure any bigger than this. It gets too big, you know, it gets too heavy. It's going to mire down in the spring. We don't have a tractor big enough to pull it. You know, the things, you put all those all those 400 birds in there at five pounds a piece, that's 2,000 pounds of chicken. So, you know, this thing gets heavy and, and uh, you can't move it. How can, we, how can we do more of this? Aha, a train. So we made a hitch on the back of it and built a second one. 
and hooked it to the back of the first one, and now we run 800, and you know what's amazing? It doesn't take one more minute to hook up the tractor and move 800 as it did to hook up the three-point hitch and move 40. So the principle is, if we're going to have infrastructure, we want to run that infrastructure to its maximum economy of scale. Because, you know, a lot of us in, you know, sustainable ag think, whenever anybody says economy of scale, we need to think Monsanto, it's like, it's like it's a, it's a swear word. You, know? you never, you can't say economy of scale. You can't say that. That's what, that's what's got us into the problem we're in, economy of scale. But there are economies of scale. The fact is, there are economies of scale. And it is easier to move those birds at 800. And when we go out, and I used to, before the days of four-wheelers, I used to have to walk out and carry the baskets of eggs back here we have for this part of the chore. Now we go out with a four-wheeler and bring in, 100, and bring in uh, 40 dozen eggs at $4. That's 160 bucks. Suddenly, that trip out pays the gas and depreciation on the four-wheeler. It takes half the time of me walking out there bringing in five dozen. Okay? So uh, I'm using this as an example because I just came from California this morning. And in the last two days, I've been on a couple farms out there with eggmobiles. And, and, and great farms, doing wonderfully. I was on one, they have three eggmobiles with 150 chickens in three different eggmobiles that they move independently with 100 minutes. I said, have you ever thought about hooking two together? Oh, we never thought about that. Uh, you know, come on, we, we gotta be smart here. We gotta think. You know, the industry does common motion studies. This brings me to another thing we need to be doing. I don't, Common motion studies, okay? You as a farmer, if I ask you, how many person minutes does it take to put away a dozen eggs? If, if, you're, if you're a grown ass, you should be able to tell me. How many acres of hay can you mow per hour? You should be able to tell me. How many person hours per bale of hay does it take to put it in the mouth? You should tell me. How many minutes a day does it take to set up a cross fence for cows and move? You should be able to tell me. Okay? So, all over our place, we have all these benchmarks of efficiency written down. You should be able to gut a chicken in 30 seconds. You can't gut a chicken in 30 seconds, you're not going to make it. Now, don't get frustrated and say, I'm going to quit. Work at it. Don't just assume that, well, a minute's good enough. No, a minute's not good enough. It's not good enough to stay in the business, OK? Our benchmark for eggs is 30 dozen every 20 person minutes. You can't put away 30 dozen every 20 person minutes, you got problems. Then, you're, in order to get your labor back, you're going to have to charge so much that marketing is going to be difficult. So, I, I'm not suggesting what your benchmarks have to be. I'm just suggesting we need to be doing time and motion studies to figure it out. We know that we need to move chicken shelters in the field at 60 seconds per shelter. That's our benchmark. And you know, we have wonderful young people who come through our internship and apprenticeship program. And you know what? Not one in ten goes out there with a stopwatch to see if they're attaining 60 seconds per shelter. What I'm trying to get us to understand here today is that until you go out with a stopwatch and do a time of motion study and get a benchmark and know where you are, you, how, do we, how do we know what it's costing us? How do we know? Whether, how do we know how to improve? Okay? I'm not fussing at you. I'm, I'm encouraging us, okay? We can think like businesses. And I think too many of us as farmers, we have this kind of chip on our shoulder like we feed the world and we do this amazing.
noble, sacred, you know, profession, and the world owes us something. You know what the world doesn't owe us? Like nothing. You earn what you get. And, and, and part of earning it is thinking like a business person. Now, don't think like a missionary. <laughs> think like a business person. I'm not trying to diss missionaries. I think that that's right. But, but they don't have a mega problem. They have another deal. Okay? And so think like a business person. And every business in the, in the world that's successful routinely does who represents McDonald's. He came out to the farm. Several years ago, McDonald's was actually talking about doing a grass-finished uh, burger at McDonald's. And so the vice presidents of marketing and new sales sent uh, their, their Washington, D.C. attorney uh, out to us to visit with me and see if, if I would cut their heads off if you know, McDonald's executives came out. <laughs> Kind of, a, kind of a, you know, an initial uh, scoping deal. And uh, we spent half a day together, delightful. He told me that, the, that they had a whole staff on how many people of technicians at McDonald's headquarters, that this whole staff, all they do every single day is move furniture around and use a stopwatch and do time and motion studies for cooking and movement of stuff in the McDonald's kitchen. And he said, if we can shave off, if we can shave off half a second for a procedure, that's equal to a million dollars in savings. So we as farmers, we, we need to start thinking like this. Uh, my dad used to say, nobody can spend more than four hours a day doing chores. So this will be another quote. <laughs> nobody can spend more than four hours doing chores a day because you need time to make progress, to do new things. Chores are things that have to be done at the same time every single day. So you want to bundle everything. Okay? So what you want to do, so, so for example, if you're having to run, let's say you've got chickens in the field, and you're having to run out there every morning with uh, buckets of, of feed for those chickens, if you suddenly make a trailer that can handle 4,000 pounds of feed and park it at the chickens, you just suddenly room change chores. Because now you've got, you've got a bulk bin that you can fill once a month, and you don't have to cut, you don't have to run out there with all the feet, run across the ground, make a rut, make a river, whatever. Every day, you can have, now you can walk out and be parked with four-wheeler and all the feet sitting there waiting on you when you get there. Okay? So what we want to do is we want to, we want to bundle these things. And then, we've got to look at margins. And, of course, as small farmers, we want to wear more hats. One of the best ways that we have of becoming full-time is to take advantage of the margin that all the middle people take of our products on the way to market. I'm sure you say it out here. Have you ever heard of Farmer Browse that the middle man makes all the money? Right? The middle man makes all the profit? Well, that's where the profit is. I want to be one! Okay? So count me in. And that's going to take you know, marketing, distribution, all of those things, inventory. That takes a lot of uh, that takes a lot of money in the system. And that's why the commodity farmer gets paid very little. Is because as soon as you start down those things and you start, you know, realizing how much, how hard that is to do the marketing and the distribution and the inventory control and the processing. Suddenly, all right. But the difference between a, a, a chicken that's raised for Tyson in a Tyson chicken house and a chicken that you raise and take all the way to oven ready in a package, 
you get to enjoy all of those added values here, okay? And so, some of the biggest things that a small farmer can do is leverage the well we already have, the water system we already have, the road frontage we already have, the, 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 uh, the family members, the family members that we already have. And we can leverage all that and take our product to another value and get the additional amount. Um, Daniel has his rabbits. Our son has his rabbits since he was eight. And um, the going rate for rabbits is uh, about a dollar fifty a pound live weight. That's right now. It's the industry will pay for rabbits. So a three pound fryer is four dollars and fifty cents. Well, Daniel can butcher 20 an hour, and the going rate retail for oven-ready rabbits, you know, just a packaged whole rabbit fryer, is $8 a pound. Well, at 20 rabbits an hour, he can take that rabbit from $4.50 to $24 at a rate of 20 rabbits an hour. Uh, we got somebody that's a math wizard. How much? $400 per hour. $400 per hour. Who can work for 400 bucks an hour? Okay. Same thing is true with poultry. That's why uh, Featherman is here. Same thing is true with poultry. It's true to a lot of things. And so, um, and, and on our farm, we are, we are consistently looking for how we can value add. And sometimes, you don't have to do it all you can partner. Uh, for example, you know, we don't have a, a, a licensed commercial kitchen on our farm. We're desperate to take these uh, chicken backs and necks and turn them into chicken stock to sell to our customers. Well, we don't, right now, we don't have the manpower to do it. We don't have the facilities to do it. And so we found a, an outfit up in Northern Virginia called 100 Bowls of Soup. And they'll do it for us. And so last week we got our first 500 quarts back of chicken stock. We stuck it on the website. And in the first 24 hours, we sold seven quarts in the first 24 hours. And, we're, and, and it is allowing us to make three dollars a pound on backs and necks, yeah. which were a big problem. Some of them, you know, we, we couldn't even sell. We had to practically, you know, give them away fifty cents a pound just to, you know, just to move them out. Yeah. Uh, we're working with an outfit in Richmond that makes uh, it's a family that make uh, artisanal. Yeah. Cracked eggs and real itty bitty smalls are always a problem. You got to, you know, hard to sell. I wouldn't sell cracked, uh, except for friends or you know, more recent situations. Well, we're working with them to turn all of our hard to sell eggs, the cracks and the little itty bitty ones, into pasta egg noodles. And there again, suddenly, with the value add, we're going to get $4 a dozen for cracked eggs, okay? So what we want to do is think about value adding and taking everything that we have to its next level. And a lot of times, a lot of times that takes skill sets that utilizes other people in the family. And that leverages downtime. You know, I should have started this whole thing by saying the first thing that everybody needs to do if you really want to farm full time is to take your deer rifle and your television, <laughs> go up on the hill and do some target practice. You know, uh, you know, the latest Pew Pew uh, uh, survey said that the average American male between 25 and 35 years old spends 20 hours a week playing video games. That's not college students. That's that's 25 to 35 year old American males in the front of their you know their girls playing video games. I mean that's enough time to start a business. Okay. The average nine to eighteen year olds spends 
seven and a half hours a day on an electronic machine. Folks, that's a lot of time, isn't it? So we, we, need, to, we, need, to, uh, we need to leverage that time and begin using it accordingly. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop there and go to questions for the last 10 minutes and, uh, and let you know where, where we go. There's, there's, there's so much to talk about how to turn that into a full-time business. So uh, we've got a question right here. We'll just, we'll just go around. And, and rule of thumb for my Q&A is uh, there's no taboo subject. I mean, you know, it's okay. Politics, religion, uh, you know, inheritance, child rearing, it doesn't matter. Just go ahead. Yes. I'm particularly interested in your mob stocking. I really like your 2008 paper that you wrote. And uh, I'm curious, the latest developments on that, and then also how, you, uh, if you've done a calculation, the number of uh, pounds of beef per acre you can produce with that system, and then the chickens also, whether, I mean, especially the grain, the grainless chickens that you're talking about, where you let them forage behind the cows and so forth. Well, we don't have any grainless chickens. I mean, um, we still feed them grain. Here, 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 here's the problem. Here's the, here, here's, here's the, 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 that's a great kind of segue into this issue. As we were growing these chickens, when we started that first big egg mobile with 100 birds in it, in the summertime, they basically didn't eat anything. They just lived off the land. Okay? When we went to 200, 200 chickens will not cover any more land than 100 because they'll only range out so far from the egg mobile. Okay? So those 100, there was enough cream there to basically satisfy their needs if you move them every day. Okay. With the 200, there was, so now we have to start supplemental feeding. The problem is that if you value your time your, and your diesel fuel, you have to get $15 a dozen for your eggs if you just have 100 in the egg mobile. Now, there's no question they're better eggs. I'm, I'm being real transparent. The, the fact is, we pick our batch and we pick our compromise. And so our compromise is we put 800 birds in there. They only supplement their feed about 15 to 20 percent, which is which is still extremely helpful. They get their, but it suddenly makes our transportation because the cost is in being there. So this is the problem. The cost is in being there. And so if we can bring in $150 worth of eggs. Instead of instead of well, or bringing forty dozen instead of five dozen, suddenly that cost of being there, the overhead is transferred over those eggs. So we readily admit that we compromise the quality by feeding grain, but that makes it viable so that we can charge four dollars a dozen instead of fifteen to twenty dollars. And there are certain factors that come to help. So so you know that that's a that's a that, those are the those are the conundrums. Now, as far as uh, mob stocking, uh, this is where we've done some real serious uh, calculations, watching what we're doing. And uh, a couple of things I want to just point out. Number one is farmers don't get paid for individual animal performance. I'm talking about beef cattle here, okay? We don't get paid for individual animal performance. We get paid for converting biomass into meat and milk. And so there's a there's a there's a balance here, there's a teeter top. As you as you push gain per acre, as you as you increase gain per acre, you reduce gain per individual. Your highest gain per individual is your least gain per acre. The highest gain per individual is to turn one cap on 100 acres and let it just pick clover blossoms all day. Right? And so we always have to run. We're, 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 we're on this. Yeah. We're, we're, on, we're, on this, we're on this balancing act between the, per, the individual gain and the aggregate gain. Well, you and I get paid for on aggregate gain. Well, if you if you push that to its ultimate, 
What you do is so reduce daily gain that you come up with a bad product. I mean, it's tough, stringy, game, you know, it's, it's, it's got a problem. Maybe it's not even healthy, okay? And so, we have, so that's where, the, that's where the, the, art, the art comes in. So you have to decide kind of where that is. And, um, and once we push through all of that, then it just became a matter of, it's much cheaper to move a big herd than a little herd because every herd, whether it's five cows or 500 cows, needs a front fence, a back fence, a water trough, and a mineral box. Okay? It doesn't take any longer to sit there and hold the gate open for 500 to go through. I mean, it might take another two minutes. But that's a fun two minutes. To stand there and watch 500 come through as to go out and let 50 come through. And so, there are things that really, that really uh, show up big on economies of scale, and and to me the most the most the biggest one is ur raising herbivores, and you know and that is a natural thought. You know, raising herbivores, they do in nature they see these millions of. Well, I mean, uh, Captain Bridger said he ran into a herd of seven million buffalo up in you know the Black Hills of Dakota. I don't know who was standing there in the county. Uh, they, they aggregate in, into pretty big herds. And so the herbivore is the easiest. The, the, it, it doesn't transfer when you're, say, putting away eggs by hand. It doesn't, you don't get economies of scale because if you're putting them by hand and not mechanically, there's no advantage over the 69th dozen than the 68th dozen. And so we've had, to, we've had to segregate in time motion our different products to articulate this one is very sensitive, that this one really responds to aggregation and economies of scale, this one doesn't respond to aggregation and economies of scale. So that's another nuance of the whole question. But you get there, you get there by acting like a business person and keeping those records. So what we found is with our Bob Stocking, uh, we're now running herds routinely, you know, five to 700 head in a herd. And what we're finding is it's much, much, much cheaper to spend three to $5,000 a summer to a bunch of young bucks with, uh, you know, with uh, gooseneck trailers to take them from farm to farm and have all the herd amalgamated than it is to separate the herd out onto the different farms and move several a day. You start pushing the pencil on that and you can pay for a pile of hauling. We rent eight pieces of property now. So we've got, and they're not contiguous, not all of them. And so we have to cart the animals around. And you know, it hurts to spend five or you know, ten thousand dollars a year in, in, in custom hauling, but to have all those amalgamated at one time so they only have to be moved one day, that way, that way. We, we have interns and apprentices on these other farms that are running them. They can actually take three months off while nobody's there and do other things and go on a cruise or, or you know, take a month off. And so, so the amalgamation suddenly creates even a labor situation that gives you time to, to adjust and be seasonal about, about the production as well. Yes? Quick over here. Oh. Uh, so you're going for your livestock and for your succession. If you were going to add a breed of livestock or a new crop, what would it be and why? If we were going to add something, what would it be and why? Um, well, uh, we have added, as of three years ago, we've added horticulture. We've already got the customer. We added the shiitake mushrooms and line caps for barrier mushrooms. Uh, we've already added the horticulture, so that's been a very recent, that is not being exploited at all. Um, uh, we have just this year gotten our license to cook on site so that all the visitors who come and tours we do, we can offer hot dogs and, and you know, things like that to them. Um, so, I, I, I guess, at this point, my answer to the question, is we've got a list this long of things that would be complementary, that would be synergistic, you know, what we're doing. Right now, 
the determining factor is who wants to do it. I mean, we came this close uh, eight years ago to offering a full-time, you know, basically an independent contractor position to a guy who was, in, who was a culinary guy and wanted to do a commercial kitchen. We did a business plan, did the whole thing, and then, and then it, it fell apart. Uh, we decided to go on and, and finish school, which was fabulous, uh, but that didn't happen. Uh, we offered um, an independent business to a guy that came. He was a he was a uh, one of these bread oven, you know, uh, mason clay oven uh, baker guys, and uh, and we came real close, and then suddenly um, his girlfriend inherited a farm in Missouri and or Arkansas, and they took off to the farm. I can blame them for that. Um, we came this close to a, with a fellow that uh, was a crackerjack woodworker. Always wanted to run a woodworking shop. Great, because great. We've got all this 450 acres of great Appalachian hardwoods, a bandsaw mill, we have all this lumber. You know, we don't, we don't mill the, who knows, you know, 20, 25 days a year. Well, that thing could be run a lot more. We could harvest a lot more timber. And, and um, so we came this close to him coming and building a woodworking shop that, that he would own, market under our network, um, and then it turned out his wife didn't want to leave this lane. And so we have a list of this. I mean, basically, the sky is the limit. You got something that can complement what we're doing. We have an open door policy. Come, add it to us. We're, we welcome it. But basically, it's, it, it's person, gift, passion driven. And whatever you've got to come to the pot and add to it, we're all about it. It's all about the people. We're going to take a 15 minute break and come back and talk about the uh, farm with our kids. Okay, good. Local 
90 artisans guild. It's, a, it, it, it's all the local craft people that some do fabric, photography, pottery, woodworking, ceramics, all the local artists. And, uh, and, and they have put themselves together in a retail storefront in Stanton, kind of in the little touristy section of the Victorian uh, restored village. And, and uh, she runs that, that, um, that shop and, and been very successful with it. So we're real proud of her. She does all my power plants. She does uh, a lot of our, she has a note card collection. So where I'm going with this is, from day one, uh, I mean, one of the reasons that I enjoyed the farm was because um, as a little child, I started with some chickens, and they weren't a subset of Dad's Enterprise. So my first rule is independent businesses for our children. Not subsets of what we're doing, but something totally different that can be their fiefdom. You know, everybody wants to have their claim to fame. And so for me, it was my chickens. And I did that all through, you know, uh, elementary school, middle, high school, and all that. And um, sold at the curb market downtown with uh, two elderly uh, grandma matrons who taught me everything I know about marketing. And I wouldn't trade that experience for the world. I was up all through high, from 14 years old to graduate from high school, I was up every single Saturday. Uh, of the year at uh, 4 o'clock to be down there at the farmer's market, at the curb market at 6. And uh, so that's the way I grew up. No reason I had kids. Um, we wanted the same thing for them for businesses. And so, um, so Daniel started to hate with his rabbit business. And, uh, you know, he, he, some, some friends were moving from, um, from country to town. And the new landlord wouldn't let them bring their rabbits. They had two, they had three rabbits. And so uh, Daniel was going to do an enterprise, and my older brother had had rabbits when he was a child. And um, and so Daniel just said, well, I think I'd like to have rabbits. He was eight. And so these friends gave Daniel the three rabbits. And uh, we built a shelter and started moving around the lawn there. And, and uh, ever the uh, entrepreneur, why he said, well, I think I'll see what I can do with these. And so uh, we put a little blurb in the newsletter that spring. You know, Daniel's doing rabbits. You know, we, who eats rabbits? Who eats rabbits? You know? Well, to show you the leveraging effect of diversification, in two weeks, he had orders for 150 rabbits. <laughs> and that's pretty quick even for rabbits. <laughs> so it took him more than a year that he got in the first two weeks of introducing, but that's the leverage of complementary enterprises. And so one of the, to me, one of the greatest benefits of a direct market farm is that it creates these synergistic enterprise opportunities for children to work in to work into the farm. And uh, so uh, he had his rabbit business all the way through. Now, you know, he's, he still has them, uh, and, and he's had them. He's 31 now, so that's, what, 23 years. And it very well may be the largest commercial flock of rabbits in the country that has been 23 years line bred with no outside genetics, completely line bred for 23 years to be forage-based, no medications and no vaccines. So now he sells more breeding stock than he does meat rabbits for a lot more money. He's got, he's got his breeding stock in everything from California to Oregon to you know, the East Coast to wherever. Our daughter Rachel, uh, she got to be about six or seven. She's our artsy, little artist, you know. Well, what can you do? So uh, she started making these little, uh, these little uh, pot holder looms. He gets this little plastic loom and he makes little pot holders. And of course, you know, her color coordination, she can make these little pretty ones, you know. Now, who can turn down a cherubic six-year-old that looks up and says, I want to buy a pot holder? For two bucks, I mean, she's got 25 cents worth of stuff in it, a little bit of time. The beauty of children and businesses is that their time isn't worth anything. You know? <laughs>
And so, uh, so th this, this gives a much broader range of opportunity for, for children businesses. And uh, so, you know, Daniel had his rabbits, Rachel had that, and then, then as she got older, she started with her baking, she did zucchini bread and pound cakes. And, uh, and I can't tell you what it does to a child when a, you know, when a, a lady comes up and pinches her cheeks, you know, nine years old, are you the girl that I had pound cake at my garden club last week and all the ladies thought it was the greatest thing in the world? And you know what that does to the self-actualization of a child? I mean, boy, that be thank you birds all the pieces. <laughs> and, and I think we've really destroyed a lot of soul of our youth in this country that, that, we have, that we have created a situation where the greatest pleasure in life is being the greatest, uh, you know, points getter on a Game Boy game instead of being affirmed in true self-worth by a craft or a service that we presented to the whole world. And I think it's tragic in our culture that we have used child labor laws to essentially criminalize, marginalize, and demonize all of the useful chores and things that children used to do around the house to develop their own identity, self-worth, and their own personhood as productive members of society. And so I think as we start down this path, we need to think about creating these opportunities for our kids. Um, to, to encourage this, this, this self-reliance and this uh, doing meaningful work, not menial work, meaningful work. And so Rachel Griffith was a uh, pound cake. Then by the time she was uh, 15, she started running a house cleaning business. And uh, then she started employing her cousin. And by the time she was 16, bottom line is, I uh, really, there's one thing I get proud about, this is one of them. Both of our kids hit 20 years old with $20,000 in the bank, and we never paid them all that. Okay? That's pretty cool. All right, that's pretty cool. Daniel used his when he got married to build his house. So here he, you know, he was able to, we, we built a lumber, we, you know, he did the labor, but he built the whole house, the spot there, Get free, no more. Boom. Um, Rachel used her schooling and other things, and she, she still has a pop like Rachel. Whew. And I always said that you know that my, my greatest my greatest success as a farmer was marrying a wife that's more frugal than I am. <laughs> and you guys, you got looking for a wife, you know, you don't want a hard keeper. <laughs> paint low and the entertainment low. <laughs> Be in good shape. All right, so, um, so our kids grew up with these businesses. Now, inculcating them into it when they got old enough to really work with us, then we paid them for things. And we actually sat down and said, what, what would you like to get paid for this? What's a pay scale? What's a remuneration scale? Now, when they're real small, of course, there are things that they don't get paid for, chores and things like that. And we really separate work from chores, from, from just chores. And that there are, we don't believe in allowances. Nobody should get paid for breathing. And all children need to learn that there are things you do simply because you're in humanity. I mean, you shouldn't get paid for making your bed, taking out your trash, and hanging up your clothes, and washing dishes. That's what you do because you're a member of people. You're a member of society, okay? And, and, and I think that if we give our kids an allowance and pay them for every little every little item that they do, it, it can make them think that society owes them a living for breathing. And that's not healthy, all right? But we also want them to have a very healthy sense of self-worth that I'm not going to work for nothing, all right? Now, let's give a couple of principles for, uh, for working together as children. My, my, and if you don't hear me say one other thing today, this is enough to change 90% of the households in America, in my opinion. That is, when you're working with your kids or when you want them to do something, 
Do not create tasks. Do not create time. Good grief, what kind of gibberish is that? What I'm saying is, never say go practice the piano for 30 minutes. Sit down and say, what are you working on? Now, when you get it to a certain uh, place of proficiency, you can quit. That's task-oriented, not time-oriented. Time-oriented tasking teaches dogma. If there's no incentive for performance or function, all you teach is laziness, negligence, and sloth. What we've got to do is incentivize complete performance. Never say, go pull weeds for an hour. Go out, take some surveyor's tape. We're going to pull weeds from here to here. Mark out the task. And then say, when you get them pulled, you can be done. That way, and when you're done, you, you provide an age-appropriate incentive, whether it's, you know, reading a story or, or free time or go building the fort in the woods or whatever. So you key, you key every task to a completion test. Um, you, you, you don't give time-oriented tests. Is everybody with me on this? This is a, this is a breakthrough. This is a, this is a breakthrough. Because so many how do I care kids you know, to not, they go out and sit them out there in the garden to work and they're just that next thing I know they're throwing peas at each other. <laughs> or, they're, or they're just sitting there, you know, petting the cat or, you know, dissecting the earthworm, whatever. And I don't have a problem with dissecting the earthworm. I don't even have any problem with stopping to smell the humans, you know. But there are times when you can't smell the humans. There are times when you got to get your job done. And so we want to teach task oriented. One of the things that, uh, that one of the funniest stories for me is when Daniel was, uh, he was like, uh, well, he, he, I mean, we homeschool, so our kids are with us, you know, from day one. He needed to go out in diapers, you know, in the early days. I, maybe I build the fence. This is one I really remember. And uh, you know, he, he diapers, and he's whatever, a uh, year and a half old. He's got a little talk a truck or whatever. He's, you know, making roads in the dirt there while I'm digging the fence post hole. He starts to whine, I'm thirsty. Damn thirsty. No, Daniel, we can't have a drink until I finish another fence post hole. That's my, that's my reward for, for completing. And I pace myself. I, I'm not going to take a drink until I finish this next post hole. And so he kind of grew up that way. When he got to be about eight or nine, a little neighbor boy, they got to be friends. And so his little boys are there the same age. And as little boys would want to do, you know, they, they wanted to go and build a fort over in the woods. All the boys need to go build a fort in the woods, right? So they went over in the woods uh, the first morning to start this project. So they head over into the woods, these two nine-year-old boys build this fort. About 11.30, the neighbor lady calls Teresa, my wife. She says, what is wrong with your son? He won't let our Philip have a drink until they finish the wall. Believe me, more is caught than taught. And so, uh, so, so task-oriented tests, all right? And then, and then we, we, need to, we need to pay our kids, incentivize our kids. If, if they're doing a great job and, and, and they've got an actual job that's theirs, we need to give them autonomy. Uh, if there's one, I have a couple of guests, but one of them for sure that I know is I'm a delegator. I love to delegate. My dad was like that. Nothing pleased him more than to step back in the, in the shadows and watch us do our thing. And he loved to do that. And he would defer to us. You know, as a little child, somebody come to the farm and say, tell me about the chicken. Dad say, oh, I don't know anything about the chicken. I got I to get rid of the chicken guy. He'd come and get me. You know, I'm like, yeah, I'm 12 years old. And I'd go and talk about the chicken. And, and, and everybody wants a kingdom to rule. Right? We all need our, we need our perch to sing our story, right? And so our kids need that as well. And so we need to, we need to give them autonomy over certain age-appropriate tasks. And then they grow. It needs to be their deal. And if they, need, they, need to, they need to own it. And that way, if they fail, you know, if, hey, if your child 
is, is running a, a, an egg operation, if you say, have you, you know, and you nag them, have you watered the chickens or gathered the eggs or whatever, wrong approach. They need to run as their business, and if it succeeds or fails, it's up to them. You know what? It won't take very many sales, very many failures for them to realize real quick, I better step up to the plate here. But if we sit here and nag at them and assume, assume that they will not become responsible, guess what? They won't become responsible. So if we have a really high bar, we expect responsibility and incentivize that responsibility with autonomy, 99% of the time they'll step up to it. And what that brings me to is probably the most serious thing that I'll mention, and that is we have to let them work it out. We've got a culture today of what's called helicopter parents. <laughs> Hovering over. And we need to let these kids work it out. And what that means is they need to do it poorly first. And in my book, Family Friendly Farming, I have the story of uh, my mentor on this was my dad, who was a woodworker, so such a good woodworker, he, he made his own gouges and tools in the 1930s, and then was a pattern maker at Delco Arini, which was a subsidiary of General Motors at, at the time of World, before World War II, then he went into the Army and flew, uh, flew airplanes in the Navy in World War II. But right before then, he'd gone in as a, as a uh, young uh, pattern maker. In other words, um, he, he made the wooden bowls that they poured the metal for carburetors into. I want you to think about the woodworking capability that it would take with the calipers and tiny little micrometers and, and, and to be able to make, I see you shaking your head, you know what I'm talking about, well, that's an engineering background, uh, to make the mold that they pour that, that, out of wood. So what I'm getting to is he was a master woodworker. I mean, he could make joints that you couldn't stick a sheet of paper in. I am not a master woodworker. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a type AAA, choleric, you know, just get her done. It doesn't matter what it looks like. Totally function over form. You know, and this is a weakness that I have. And so my ladies, especially my daughter, has spent her life trying to get dad to become more concerned about what the farm looks like, what the people see when they come, where are the piles of unfinished products, the projects, you know, where is the, where is the metal pile and the wood pile and the sawdust pile and the compost pile and you know, all these things. Everybody's all about, about this, this beauty and, and has brought him so whenever we do projects that require some landscaping or beauty or design, guess who's in charge of it? Does the lays the paper out, makes the blue print, it's great. Okay. So uh, so here I was with this dad that, that, that I grew up with that just you know, could make anything. And the best, the closest I ever came to a 90 degree angle was about 87. You know what? He never said a word. He never said a word. What that did was it freed me up to experiment, to try, to innovate, to create. I'll tell you what, we've got uh, we've got a lot of memories of fussy dads and fussy moms. The illustration I use is bent over nails. You know, you can go out with dad and spend, you know, a little uh, 12 year old and spend all day building something together, and the 12 year old bends over one nail and dad fusses about it. Not good enough. And we'll remember 
that fuss for the rest of our lives. We got to get away from being fussy parents. Skill will come. The way they drop straight nails at 16 is to let them bend over nails at 12. The way they learn how to make patterns and dresses and crank out stuff at, 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 at 16 is because of a bunch of crooked stitches at 10. Okay? And so we need, we need to be careful. And you know what? If you don't know whether you're a fussy parent, ask your spouse. They'll tell you. I've had my come up with stuff. And I'm being, I'm being as open as I can be, okay, transparent. But these, these, see, these are the things that we can be all excited about the farm and about the cows and about the garden and all that. But you know what? If the family's broken, the whole thing's broken. At the end of the day, isn't it? We have, you know, we have this funny thing, mama ain't happy, ain't nobody happy. Well, the fact is, if the kids aren't happy, ain't nobody happy. If dad ain't happy, ain't nobody happy. The fact is, if people aren't happy, ain't nobody happy. Doesn't matter who it is. Okay? So we've got to be quick to praise and slow to, you know, create that judgment. Now, uh, as the family has gotten older, of course, the kids have gotten older, one of the best things Probably the best money I ever spent in my life was, I don't know what, five years ago. Um, I tried to encourage Dave Pratt, a ranching for profit fame, to move an executive link out to the East Coast. And um, as I, I just think that the ranching for profit program is just, is just outstanding. And so, uh, anyway, I, I, I had to come out and do the uh, the two-day financial part uh, in Rona, in Virginia, as a, as a pump driver. Um, and uh, I paid the full price for Teresa and I, Daniel and Sherry, to go to that. It was pricey. Best money I ever spent. Now, it turned out that they didn't get enough, you know, business there to establish an executive link, and to my, a little bit of frustration, but, but surprise, Teresa, Daniel, and Sherry didn't think that it would help us very much. They thought that because of dad's being, you know, uh, student, we, we were already doing a lot of the stuff, okay? Um, but what it did do was it took the family away from the farm, together, and Daniel and Sherry felt like equals with us as we went away and focused on the farm in a working on the business seminar as equals. And so, where we need to get to in these family businesses is where, as we excite those young people with opportunity to come into it, is we need to create a path so that it's not now mom and dad's farm. They appreciate it as equals and become equal stakeholders. And the joy of my life now is I'm, I'm, you know, I'm gone from home now a third of the time, a third of the year I'm gone. And I know that I can go away for two weeks. I was in Australia for, and New Zealand for a month. Uh, fall a few years ago. And I can go away on a trip and do a speaking circuit and I know that Daniel's going to take care of every single thing and make every single decision in every single crisis exactly the way I would make that decision. And I can't tell you what a liberating thing that is to be able to be here with you all and know whatever crisis we have at home doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. I mean, a crisis is a crisis. Nobody wants a crisis, right? I, I, I hope they don't have a crisis. Okay, but you know, farming, you have a crisis sometimes. No matter what crisis comes, the judgment, the discernment, the decision for that thing is going to be whatever I. And if it's over his head, you know what? Well, call me and ask my advice. There is nothing 
There's nothing like an old geezer having a young buck ask his advice. Okay? And so uh, I'm going to stop there because uh, there's a lot of this material. Uh, but, but I, you know, this, this is one of the most heart-centered, difficult things to talk about in farming because it's a taboo subject. Isn't it? We don't we don't talk about these things, and so uh, so we're gonna we're gonna open it up here for questions. We've got we've got a good bit of time. There's a, there's a lot here to go, so I'm, I'm glad to entertain questions. And believe me, we don't have it all figured out, and we make mistakes. One day I came back. I've been gone for a week. I came back. I saw a couple of things I didn't like. I jumped in a little bit. He was under pressure from some things. By the time it was over, I had to completely apologize. We embraced and kissed. Here's a dad, 50 years old, kissing his 25 year old son, apologizing. You know what that does? For him, we need to get to that. We need to get to that. Okay? Yeah, Joel, uh, I'm a good friend of Frank Capano. I want to ask you a couple of questions about Iowa agriculture. Uh, we farm in Northeast Iowa. About 90% of the counties in Iowa have about the same population they had in about 1890. Our, our county is a good example of that. That the population is generally aging. Today, with a fairly intense concentration of wealth, so we have a, a lot of poor people, <coughs> uh, very few outlandishly rich people, uh, but really no more in the average county. Now, 10% of the counties in Iowa, including this one, so it's not that way at all. Plus, we have intense concentration ownership of the farmland. Um, and my question to you is your impression of probably the Midwest in general. Um, how are we going to create opportunities for people in that agriculture? What we're really trying to say is the economy we live in direct marketing and the efforts we've been to are really thwarted by the fact that just aren't there many people there. That is a big problem in the Midwest. Uh, just the fact that it's not a population, that the population is declining, and, and there isn't much. Um, you know, uh, Sometimes you have to go where people are. And, you know, uh, I don't know where to move away. <laughs> but, uh, but sometimes, if you can't see your way to an opportunity where you are, sometimes you need to go where an opportunity is. And, um, you know, I, I counsel people all the time. I would much rather buy a 30 acre farm on the, end of, on the edge of a town than a 2,000 acre farm in the middle of nowhere simply for the opportunity that, that, that it offers or, or, or get hooked up with it. Um, but my sense is that, that there is probably more opportunity than a lot of people think if we start doing something really differently, growing a different product, uh, uh, stacking a different product, you know, on the land base, getting some of this synergy involved. Um, I, I run the numerous people here that are direct marketing and running at it. Um, your county may be just a little bit different, but um, I, I've seen too many people be too creative to think that generally there's no opportunity. I mean, usually there's something you just have to you just have to become really out of the box and and, and create it, add a different enterprise, add a new enterprise, and. Um, and do something that nobody else is doing, but but uh, it, it is a problem, you know. I, I, I'm I'm you know, I'll be honest with you. I'm glad I'm not in the most rural area of Iowa. Uh, it would it would be more difficult, and so uh, that is a consideration. Yeah, I appreciate, I appreciate the problem. I wish I had a magic answer, but I, I don't have a magic answer. Yeah, that's a good question. Yes. Thanks. I know you've run a lot of uh, interns and apprentices. Uh, 
great question. Um, yeah, we have, we have, uh, we've been doing apprenticeship for almost 20 years, the interns for about five, and, um, and the, the ones, the ones who want to farm, virtually all of them have been successful. And if you go on our website, polybasefarms.com, you'll see them, you'll see them listed. Uh, the ones that want to be listed that are now making differences themselves or interns or whatever. Um, they, they, the ones who wanted to farm have been pretty successful. It's, you know, it's amazing though what has derailed many of them. Um, I mean, like, like one from upstate uh, Washington fell in love with a girl across the border in uh, Canada, British Columbia, and, um, and he, was, he was farming, getting along very, very well. Area and uh, immigration naturalization service uh, had he had to fill out paperwork to get you know, the bride across the border, you know. And uh, they asked him for his occupation, he said farmer and uh, you know, on the form. And the form got kicked back out and said that's not an acceptable occupation because the INS assumes that. Um, well, I mean, what they're trying to do is not bring somebody across the border that's going to go on, you know, welfare, okay? And so they want bona fide occupations. And uh, farming was not a bona fide occupation for the INS. So he quit the farm, started driving a truck, and he had to commit to five years of a real job uh, in order to get married and get this gal across the border. Uh, so I mean, that's, that's just one example, but there are several examples that are, that are like that of things that derail people on their way out. But all the ones who have really wanted to farm uh, have been extremely, extremely successful. And uh, some of you might know Galen Bontrager, right here in, he's in uh, Tacoma. Yeah, Tacoma, yeah. And uh, he's, he's hanging in there, uh, even without a wife, which is, uh, you know, Two and a half strikes against you. So, uh, you know, I, I'm a believer in that, you know, that picture. The guy puts on this thing, you know, uh, farm, uh, puts a one ad out, you know, farm white one, uh, he knows how to cook and sew, and, uh, drive tractor, and, and owns tractor. Please send a picture of tractor. <laughs> But yeah, they, they've been they've been very successful in, in all over the all over the place. We have one, you know, we have one in Mexico, uh, Pennsylvania, Virginia, um, uh, Oregon, Washington, California. You know, I mean, you think we've got two? We've got one uh, that's now sec second year in California. He knocked around tough for a year. Uh, he had a bad landlord situation one year, and he, he's. None of these kids are for money family. They, 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 they go without a dime, basically. And, and they start, uh, and, and that's one of the beauties of this kind of, of uh, portable, this portable farm that, that we have, where every, all the infrastructure is portable, it makes the entire farm portable. And that way you can do it on a piece of rented land for a year, you can do it, you know, you, you, you can squat uh, behind some conservation easement that nobody visits or something, I mean, you can, yeah. You can start somewhere, and the whole farm is portable. And if you lose that, and you need to go to another spot. You load the farm up on a low boy trailer, and you move it down the road. That's happened many, many times. It's one of the beautiful dynamics of having a portable farm. Yeah. So yeah, they, they've been they've been well successful. Now, I will tell you this: anybody who thinks well, you're successful because it's free health, anybody who says that has not had interest. <laughs> Let me tell you about this free help. We, as we speak right now, our F-350 diesel truck is in the body shop where it got impaled by the low boy trailer with our apprentice who didn't go where Daniel told him to and got over his skis coming down the hill with a load and it fishtailed around and took out the door and the sidebar of the truck. Nice little $3,000 body job. Um, you know, the most significant one was one that said he knew how to drive a, uh, a standard 
And we said, okay. And so he got in and went down and went to the first stop sign and hit the gas instead of the clutch because he didn't know how to drive the stick. And lurched through the top stop sign. Unfortunately, nobody was coming. Took out brand new utility pole on the other side. Towed the truck. That was just nine thousand know, dollars. This, 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 this free help. <laughs> um, the reason you pay forty thousand dollars for, or whatever it is, for a college education is because education is expensive. You know that that learning curve that starts by going downhill. Well, that's where we come in. We do a lot of instruction, um, but yeah, there are there are, there are a handful. Next question. Anything? There's somebody. Earlier, earlier you were talking about your egg mobile, and you said you went from 500 chickens down to down to 400 chickens. And you said you said that that that, that was the the number that worked best for you. What size of an egg mobile do you have that, uh, that, that works, works for the more than 400 chickens? Uh, that egg mobile is 12 feet wide, 20 feet long. It's 240 and, square feet. And, and do you have roost in there for the chicken you to don't have any roost, they just sleep on the slats on the floor. And, and those 400 birds, you know, that sounds, my goodness, that's, you know, that's almost like half a square foot per bird, right? But they actually occupy only about half of the floor space. You know, chickens sleep together, they don't take a care of them. Yeah, they snuggle up their clothes. You know. When they're sleeping, we can, they, they'll sleep three birds to a square foot. Yeah. Yes? Do you let your chickens breed or did you buy them? Do we breed chickens or do we buy them from a hatchery? That's the question. That's a great question. It's a great question. Uh, we buy them from a hatchery. Now, that said, that said, what we've seen in the past 40 years is a gradual decline in genetic strength from hatchery chickens. Because for generations, the hatcheries have been selecting for egg production. And you can never select for one genetic trait very long before you start sacrificing other genetic strengths, okay? And so what we've seen is in the old, we use old straight bread, I mean old um, non-hybrid bread out of the bread, barn rocks, uh, uh, black astral warps, um, uh, New Hampshire reds. And, and what happened, what's happened is that the body size has dropped way down, they're less docile, and they're much more fragile. I can, I can assure you, you haven't raised chickens for almost 50 years. They are act, they are really, really declining. And especially then when you go out on the pasture and you have weather conditions and you need brains to run under the echomobile of the hawk comes. They haven't been breeding for brains or raging ability. And well, believe me, a chicken needs all the brains she can get. It's not really big, even in a smart one. <laughs> and so this year, we're at on our list is to start hatching some. And we have one of our one of our interns, uh, so what we do is we, we lease these eight properties and we the, the, the interns and apprentices that are really good and want to stay, but what we do is interns come from June 1 to September 30 and then they can then apply to become an apprentice. So the apprentices will step up and the apprenticeship takes one year, they move into management position and really get good pay. Uh, the interns get very, you know, virtually nothing except room and board and a little stipend um, because that that's entry level. You know, that's they, 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 you got you got to you got to rehaul or die, make your place, okay, and then you can move up. But anyway, um, so we so we, we lease these other farms and uh, we place the interns and persons that want to stay with us that we can keep. Um, all these other farms as autonomous, independent contractors producing into our brand name so we can maintain a decentralized system and germinate young farmers. We've already now had two, two farmers that we've done this and they are now completely on their own, renting their own places, running their own complete autonomous businesses. Um, and, and of course we've replaced them with two new ones. 
and that's our most exciting and probably our most uh, uh, emotionally draining work now, uh, innovative work of, of creating customized autonomous packages for these germinating young farmers on these uh, nearby farms that we rent to launch their farming uh, uh, businesses. And so one of them has uh, approached me now. So, so essentially, when we have a need, if we see an opportunity, we just, we just kind of you know, throw that hook in the water. Okay, when I said our growth is, is based on the people. And uh, last week, uh, Grady, one of our, our farm uh, guys, it was a, an apprentice, um, we, he, he came up to me and he said, uh, I want to I do this hatching thing. So uh, where we're going to start is with some roosters on our oldest late two-year-old hens so that we know that at least whatever females we breed have survived and been healthy for two years. You know, Kit Pharaoh, the cattle guru, says that if we never use one ounce of, of uh, bull semen from any bull in the U.S., from, if we never kept one single bull from a cow younger than 10, it would fundamentally change the, the health, vigor, and functionality of the beef herd in the U.S. The whole emphasis is on, you know, EPDs and youngest, 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 but youngest is unproven. And so uh, when we select our bulls, we don't even look at a cow that's under 10 years old. She's been with you 10 years, you know, she's done her job, all right? I mean, that's a place to start, isn't it? And when we talk about functional selection, I don't care whether yellow with big polka dots and, you know, um, um, elephant ears. If, that, if that's the phenotype and the physiology that works for us, bring it on, okay? So, uh, so we're looking at that with the hint of actually hatching our own birds, and I think that there's enough pasture poultry in need right now, I hope somebody's ears are working up, that if somebody would start a hatchery selecting, two things to select for, one is brains, livability, just Vitality, strength, okay? The other is dark yolks, because that indicates foraging ability. Nobody has selected for either of those things, maybe ever. Ever. And so, you know how it is. You have an egg mobile, right? You go out and gather uh, 500 eggs, you bring them in. One egg is a real dark, dark, you know, orange yolk. The other egg is, is a real pale, you know, yellow. Well, you know what that indicates. That chick is just lounging around the theater. She's not doing, she's not working. Well, she's a welfare parish like she's not doing anything. <laughs> so what we want are the chickens that are getting out there, getting with it, that are expressing it in that dark orange yolk. So if we were to begin selecting for brains, livability, and a dark yolk, in very short order, we can have a pastured strain of a of, of bird. In fact, I just this morning got, a, got an email from Elliot Coleman. A lot of you know who Elliot Coleman is, the Four Seasons Harvest organic guru in Maine. We're, we're buddies, we communicate routinely. And he, out of the, we haven't even talked about this, he sent me an email with this very thing. He's singing his birds. He said, Joel, if you can find me, if you can find somebody that will breed this bird. There's a market right now for a million birds in the U.S. a year, right now, for somebody that's willing to take on that project. So, everybody listen up. Another question. Reverting back to your last conversation, is there a book or article that you have published that lays out some of the benchmarks of farm efficiency you mentioned? Uh, the question is, have I laid out those benchmark farm efficiencies that I mentioned? Uh, I have not. I mean, I don't have anything that I've actually just, you know, uh, laid back. Sorry. <laughs> I, I don't have that. That would be a good article. Good, good idea. But 